Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Monahan. I'm with Aquacast Liner. I'd like to thank you for joining us for our webinar, How to Achieve Better Patient Outcomes with Spicacasts. Our featured speaker is Dr. Amy McIntosh from Scottish Rite for Children in Dallas, Texas. Um, the presentation is very quick, about 20 minutes long, and it'll be followed by a uh, question and answer period. So please prepare your questions and send to us via the chat room, and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Uh, ev everyone who registered for this event will automatically receive an email with a link to the presentation. And there are a couple of videos with showing of various application techniques that you'll want to make sure to see again. Uh, once again, we, we've had hundreds of registrations from all over the world, six continents from 29 different countries represented. And we've noticed that a large percentage of our attendees kind of joined within the first couple of minutes. So I'll give you the, the background on our speaker and we'll allow them to join as we're getting started here. So Dr. McIntosh is the medical director for patient safety at Scottish Rite, where she's also a surgeon, orthopedic surgeon. She graduated summa cum laude from Central Michigan University with a Bachelor of Science degree in sports medicine. Dr. McIntosh received her medical degree from the College of Human Medicine at Michigan State University, and she completed her residency at the Mayo School of Graduate Medical Education. She is also an associate professor of orthopedics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, also in Dallas. She is a fellow with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and an active member of POSNA, where she'll be co-hosting next month's uh, annual conference in Dallas. So she, Dr. McIntosh has received numerous honors and awards. Her clinical and research interests are focused on scoliosis with an emphasis on adolescent idiopathic scoliosis and early onset scoliosis. Her patients adore her not only for her skill as a surgeon, but her engaging personality and approach to pediatric orthopedics. We're really excited to have Dr. McIntosh join us and invite you to stick around for a special webinar offer at the conclusion of her presentation. So now I'll hand it over to Dr. McIntosh. Thanks, I'm really glad to be here. So like uh, we talked about, we're gonna be talking about hip spike casts and how to prevent um, complications. And this is I, one of my, um, I think, funniest hip spica cast videos. I was sent by a parent of my patient in the waiting room as they were coming to see me um, in my trauma clinic. Thank you. <laughs> like nobody's business, right? So we hope to get it off today. What are you doing, Mr. Man? Sorry. What? I think he said I was run I'm running. I'm running. He is trying to run. So that just proves you can actually sort of run in a hip spike cast, um, which I found fairly um, impressive. Um, and so uh, obviously this spike cast lasted him long enough to heal well enough uh, in his fractures. But I just wanted to discuss um, spike casts and some of the complications that are associated with them. And then things that you, know, you and we as a group can do to avoid those complications. Um, as we stated, I'm the medical director of patient safety. So I have the privilege of um, getting to see all and any um, complications that happen here at the hospital at Scottish Rite. And then we are you know, always being proactive to try to prevent uh, any of those from happening in the future. So for hip spike casts and uh, pediatric orthopedics, obviously we use them for femur fractures. And in general, we'll do a hip spike cast for a femur fracture up to school age. So most of the time that's kind of up to five or six years of age, um, just depending on the, the child and their uh, social situation. Um, we obviously use spike cast to treat developmental hip dysplasia. Um, and we also use hip spike cast after we uh, surgically treat neuromuscular or syndromic hip dislocations a lot of times just to protect the surgery in children that have developmental delays or sometimes don't um, feel pain um, the same way as other kids, just to try to um, hold them back while things uh, heal well enough. So I'm gonna kind of discuss those indications. And then, like we said, there's a couple videos we're gonna show and also there'll be plenty of time for 
for questions. So you can use the raise your hand feature, or you can also put uh, questions into the chat box and we will try to uh, answer them either as we go or at the end. Okay, so as we know, hip spike cast, like I said, tend to be related with a high percentage of skin complications. Um, there was a nice systematic review in the Journal of Children's Orthopedics in 2018, um, where 28%, so almost 30% of patients had skin complications. And then 8% required a return to the OR. And so this was old data out of this paper in JPO in 2011, but at that time in 2011, so that was 10 years ago, the median charge, if you needed to return to the OR to um, replace a spica cast was almost $13,000. So with in infiltration, sorry, inflation, I assume that would probably be more, even upwards of $20,000, you know, 10 years later. So anything we can do to kind of minimize those costs, I think are, are really important. I, I work here at Scottish Rite, but another part of my job is I work at a level one peds trauma center here in Dallas at Children's Medical Center. I was there um, today in the operating room and we as a group treat about 40 or 50 femur fractures a year. And I would say that's where we use um, spica casting you know, the far majority of the time. Um, so that's the first thing we're gonna focus on uh, in this talk. So um, just to recap, femur fractures in general are treated with a hip spica cast for school, preschool age children, you know, prior to kindergarten. In general, um, schools don't want you to send children to school in a spica cast uh, just because it's really hard uh, to help them go to the bathroom and get around in a wheelchair. So in general, once they hit kindergarten age, we transition to other forms of treatment for femur fractures, but it, it, they are very valuable treatment options for multiple age groups. But here in America, it just becomes less socially acceptable to have a school age child in a spica cast. The other thing that's um, true about femur fractures is in general, if you're going to spike a cast of femur fracture, there's no incisions that you need to keep clean and dry. And also these fractures in young children tend to reliably heal in four to six weeks. So that means that you have a, you know, a limited time uh, in the spike a cast. And in my mind, this is the perfect indication for a waterproof uh, hip spike a cast. There is an excellent video that is on the POSNA Academy webpage. So if you go to uh, www.posna.org and you go to POSNA Academy and you just um, search waterproof hip spica, this is the video you can see there, but also our hosts will uh, give you access to this video. It was so well done. I felt uh, no reason to try to duplicate it here in my OR. So I'm just going to play this video for you now, but it basically shows um, uh, putting a waterproof hip spica on a femur fracture. So I'm just going to let that play for you now. This is a two-year-old male who presented with leg pain after his brother jumped on him on the bed. The x-ray showed a displaced spiral fracture of the mid femoral shaft with minimal shortening. He had a close reduction with manipulation in the operating room and placement in a one-legged, fully waterproof spica cast. Waterproof casting material has been present for many years and is now more commonly used. It is well received by patients and physicians with only minor risks. There may be an increased risk of injury upon cast removal, partly due to expected high temperatures of the cast saw when cutting through fiberglass and lack of cotton as a protective layer. Using a protective plastic strip can be helpful with cast removal. This is the first documentation of a fully waterproof spica cast that allows patients to be submerged in the pool or tub. Objective, to demonstrate the technique to achieve effective waterproof casting in a one-legged spica cast for a femoral shaft fracture. Application of a one-legged spica cast was outlined by Lev et al. in 2012. This technique was followed with modified materials Waterproof cast liner rolls were used as padding. Fiberglass casting tape was used as well. The patient was placed supine on a radiolucent operating room table under general anesthesia. 
The left leg was in an abducted and flexed position with obvious swelling and deformity, mid-femur. A serum was used to confirm that the fracture reduced while axial traction was applied with the knee flexed to 45 degrees while held at the distal third of the tibia by an assistant. Three inch waterproof cast liners were used to pad the leg down to the distal third of the tibia while the assistant continued to apply traction, keeping the fracture reduced. Two layers were applied over the femur and lower leg. An additional strip was folded over and placed in the groin to provide extra padding to protect this area of bony prominence. Three inch fibroglass was then applied. This type of femur fracture tends to settle into varus and recurvatum. So therefore, the long leg cast was now molded with pressure medial and lateral to encourage valgus and anterior to posterior to encourage recurvatum. Cast padding was completed over the lower leg and foot after the fibroglass hardened over the femur. The cast was completed using two inch fibroglass. Foot pressure inside the cast could potentially cause fracture movement so the forefoot was not placed into the cast. The patient was placed on a standard spica table appropriately close to the pommel with the chest supported by the table and the abdomen free. Cast padding was placed around the abdomen. Extra room was maintained over the stomach to allow for eating as well as diapering and hygiene by placing a folded up towel in the area. Some padding was folded into three layers and placed over the posterior buttock and sacrum. A second similarly reinforced pad was placed laterally over the buttock and secured in place with another piece of padding. A long piece of padding was doubled and folded in half lengthwise and placed over the upper edge of the abdomen as a protection from the sharp edge of the fibroglass. A three inch roll of fibroglass was placed around the abdomen followed by three two inch struts made of six layers of fibroglass. These were placed laterally to connect the abdominal band and the long leg cast. The first was placed from anterior to posterior, starting proximally, and the next was placed from posterior to anterior in an X formation. The third strut was placed posterior to these and slightly overlapping them over the buttock. The struts were incorporated into the cast as they were placed using two inch fiberglass. Approximately seven rolls of three inch waterproof padding were used the cost of the seven rolls were $15 each, totaling $100, which is equal in cost to a pantaloon and used by many for spike casting. Once the cast was completed, the patient was removed from the spica table. The towel at the stomach was removed and strips of duct tape were placed around the band of cast surrounding the abdomen to keep the layers of cast padding from delaminating. A diaper was able to be pulled through the cast at this time the patient is now in a fully waterproof cast and will be able to take a bath. Okay, so that was the, the video on a waterproof uh, hip spica cast. I think for femur fractures, it offers a lot of advantages. Um, children obviously like to take baths and uh, parents like their children to be clean. Um, and I think uh, this highlights the, you know, application and use uh, very well. And again, this video will be available for you at the end of the, um, the educational session and it can be found on Posen Academy. And then the last thing they were showing is that you can put um, these strips in which the company also offers so that when you can avoid any um, cast saw burns or thermal injury when removing um, the waterproof spica casts. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about uh, developmental hip dysplasia. So if you're not a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and you're not used to looking at hip ultrasounds, this is just uh, the femoral head, this is the ilium, this is the acetabulum, and this is just showing that the hip is dislocated out of the acetabulum, the acetabulum is empty, and it's just full of usually like fatty pulvinar. That's what it looks like on an ultrasound. This is what it looks like on an x-ray. And a lot of times if the children are young under the age of one or 18 months, we can try to close reduce the hip 
we get an arthrogram to show that the hip is well reduced. But then the key is we're trying to hold that hip in position uh, in the acetabulum with a really well molded hip spica cast. So then the, this is where we use a lot of our um, Gore-Tex liners here at Scottish Rite because we don't have an ER at Scottish Rite and all the femur fractures get taken care of at Children's. So at Scottish Rite, the majority of um, Gore-Tex liners, the Aquacast Hipster is used in um, uh, developmental hip dysplasia. And so these are our you know, workhorses when doing this procedure. And the next video is going to be one of my um, new partners, Will Morris, who just put a hip spica on in the OR a, a couple of weeks ago. So I had the media team come and make a video just showing you some tips and tricks. So I'm going to show you that now. You're a little more, uh, you're a little more limited. Fortunately, he's already six to seven weeks out. And so he's a little more stable. So my first tip is that I always use an aqua liner that is one size bigger than what the company recommends, just because okay. I like to have a lot of extra room in the perineal area. As we're and, trying to get this up and over. And I feel um, like you can cut off the extra um, Gore-Tex at the leg and the abdominal area, but having a lot of extra room in the perineal area is really, really helpful. And then as we go along here, we're going to get him on the spica table. So this is my next uh, little trick that I do to get a good um, hip spica cast is once you get him onto the hip spica table. Uh, so we just got onto the spica table. Uh, you can see we're bringing the Gore-Tex liner uh, down over the top of the pad. And then we're going to tape it here close in the front, which is going to help make sure that we uh, uh, that it doesn't slide up into the cast and we're able to then take it at the uh, after cast application and fold it back over the top after we create our window. So we, you, we pull a lot of the extra perineal Gore-Tex and we, we bunch it up and we tape it to the post so that after we get the hip spica cast on, we have all this excessive aqualiner in the perineal area so that after you cut your perineal area out, you have um, really nice Gore-Tex seal and it hasn't been torn or ripped trying to uh, pull it into a, a tight space. So excessive amounts of perineal liner are really, really essential. And then I'm just gonna skip ahead. So for those of you that um, are still perfecting your hip spica cast application, rolling your soft roll is really important. So this is just gonna, demonstrate how to roll the soft roll into the perineal area to get a really good tight fitting cast in that area. Configuration, which helps give you the nice initial stability. Um, you know, the spica term uh, reflects the Latin for wheat because it has this uh, appearance of, uh, of overlap here, like uh, uh, a piece of wheat. Um, but basically so we we'll get a nice wrap here and then we'll create some splints in the back. So we overwrap it really nice and tight in the perineal area with that the, the spica right. so, orientation. Uh, so we'll have... And then something we do at Scottish Rite that I'm not sure they do a lot of other places in the country is when we first roll our spica cast, so again, we use getting... plaster in in a that nice spica wrap. the spica wrap around the perineum and the legs to really get an excellent trochanteric mold. So at this point, uh, again, for this patient, it's a little less important because we're already um, we're already six weeks out and we have a pretty stable hip, but trying to get a nice mold um, with some pressure behind a, a full flat palm on the greater trochanter posteriorly, and then a little bit of, uh, of counter pressure here anteriorly, just to help uh, maintain this nice mold, which is gonna help uh, keep the hip well reduced. And here you can see it really nicely demonstrated again with that flat palm really molding that trochanter and you're so using that wrapping, uh, to help hold the hip in um, and keep it well reduced. And then once that plaster dries, we overwrap it with fiberglass and then basically just cut out um, the perineum and then start taping the, um, 
Gore-Tex in place. So I'm going to just move ahead there. Finally shifting on the table. Uh, so we'll uh, remove the tape and get the patient off the bed. Uh, we'll talk about taking these towels out in just a second, and uh, we'll be ready to trim and pedal the cast. So now we got them off the spica table, and you can see we're going to pull these towels out. Take the towels up from the top. You want to remove that deepest towel first, so it's not pulling up on your uh, uh, not pulling up on your pantaloon. So you make sure you have plenty of room. And now there's a little bit more slack, and so you can start to take them out. Oh, but you still have to uh, watch distally that you haven't pulled out too much. Uh, so now we've got the towels out. We've got nice room uh, in our comfort cast and we're ready to start trimming. And there you can see the amount of perineal liner you have left in order for your, to allow that, sort of the, that nice waterproof seal in the perineal area. So then we just basically go ahead and start cutting the cast. And then once we do that, you can again see corners uh, secured first and then uh, there's a lot the of uh, uh, liner that you can use so to get a really those, good uh, seal here, uh, and here uh, we're using a tape that we there. like to use at Scottish Rite but some people the, uh, use uh, hockey tape some people use cast, duct tape but basically you just pedal the cast so, uh, uh, to make it um, comfortable for the patient um, and to leave we'll enough room in the perineal area uh, that you can get a small diaper on the inside the, and a larger uh, diaper on the, on the outside. And that's just case. how we finish um, that up. All right, so then I'm gonna go back to our presentation. So basically, I just want to re-emphasize that I personally always use an aqua liner that's a size bigger than recommended because I like to have the excessive amount of liner in the perineal area. Um, we take that excessive perineal area and we tape it to the post so that while you're casting, you're not constantly losing um, the liner that you want uh, down in the diaper area. We use three towels to create abdominal space and then to help really maintain that hip reduction, that trochanteric mold where we use the flat portion of our hand and we just mold over that trochanter until the plaster has dried. That is essential to holding the hip in. And then we always check uh, a wake. So we let the child wake up from anesthesia, move around in their cast, and then they go here they get a fast sequence MRI so that we can check that the hip remains well reduced um, after they've woke up and fired their muscles a little bit. And then in that MRI, we can often see the trochanteric mold. Like if you can see the flat portion of your hand, like on the trochanteric mold in the MRI scanner, then you know you've put on a really good spike cast. And then this is just me re-emphasizing that uh, very good trochanteric mold to help hold your hip in the reduced position. And then lastly, we use a lot of spica casts in our developmentally delayed children, especially kids with downs with significant hip instability. Um, they often get both femoral and pelvic osteotomies with hardware, but just because they have uh, developmental delays and oftentimes don't feel pain as normally as other children, we put hip spica casts um, on them for the first four to six weeks until we feel like they've started to heal up and callus from their surgery. And again, these don't tend to be waterproof hip spica casts because of the underlying incisions. And we don't want there to be um, a, any significant wetness around uh, those uh, post-surgical casts. And then lastly, I personally feel that if your body, if your patient or uh, it has to be in a body cast, it should be cute. So I do a lot of hip spica cast decorating. So this is just an example of a hip spica cast that looks like Jesse from Toy Story. But uh, you can basically take any character or cartoon or sport symbol and you can print it on color paper and you can cut the image out of that paper. And while the fiberglass is wet, you can just dip that image, apply it to the wet fiber glass and then wrap a wet ace wrap around it for a minute and it'll like as the fiberglass is going through its exothermic reaction the paper will literally like bind to the fiberglass and it'll almost like tattoo the cast 
Um, so I try to make uh, wearing a spike cast at least something that the child has a choice over is what decoration they can put on it. And then I feel like that gets you a lot more parental buy-in on the hip spica experience. Um, so I do decorate a lot of my hip spica cast. And then this is a picture of my son. He broke his arm. And so you heard, I went to Michigan state. So we are a household of Spartan fans. So he wanted a Sparty cast. So I personally decorated my son's cast uh, this fall and it's easy to do. It doesn't last forever, but it does bring a little happiness to wearing uh, a hip spike cast. So that's all I have. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen and then we're now ready for any questions or we can uh, work on the uh, chat questions. Yep. That, that's great. We, we do have quite a few. Um, I'll get into that. So I, uh, one of the first questions was, are there situations where a hip spike a cast would be applied in a clinic and not in the OR? Yeah. So personally, I have had, it totally depends on the patient and it depends on their parents um, and what their level of, um, you know, acceptance for some uncomfortability is. But I've had a number of patients who are like, I don't want to have to go to sleep to get on, to get my hip spike cast, you know, modified or changed. Can we do that in clinic? And we have an amazing child life team. So I've literally put on a, you know, a single leg hip spike up belly band, like you saw in that video, literally like in clinic with the child awake, watching wonderful iPad and have a child life specialist entertaining them and have, um, you know, someone, a good cast tech or someone helping me get the cast on, you know, quickly and efficiently. So I think you can totally get these casts on awake patients um, if you have the right team helping you. And then you have a parent who's willing to know that there'll be some portions of the procedure that aren't perfectly comfortable for their child, but they're willing to go through that to avoid a sedation or anesthesia. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. And you mentioned that you go up a size. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it matter if the liner bunches up when it's applied? So what I do is I just, I personally pull like the extra liner um, for the perineal area. And then I don't like it to be like super bunched up around the, the, the malleolar area or the abdominal area. So I just cut all of that extra off before I start applying the spike cast. Um, and then you don't have a lot of wrinkles, you know, in the legs or the abdominal area. And then you can see by taking out the excessive perineal um, liner and then like taping it. So it's, you know, the right amount. Then when the cast goes off, there's, when the cast is going on, there's not a lot of wrinkles. And then you just have all this sort of like extra perineal, um, uh, Gore-Tex liner so that you're not trying to stretch it or pleat it to get it to fit the perineal area. And then hopefully it won't tear and it'll stay completely intact for you. Great. And uh, doctor, there are a number of questions around plaster. So it says, um, I thought you couldn't use plaster with a waterproof cast. What happens to the right. plaster? If yeah. So that is a great point. So I want to re-emphasize I personally feel that waterproof hip spike casts are for femur fractures. They're really good for a first time developmental hip dysplasia slash dislocated hip. We personally do not use a waterproof cast here because we feel that the entire procedure is based on the mold of your cast and you're holding that hip in, in a closed manner with your cast. So we here at Scottish Rite sacrifice the waterproof hip spica and we put plaster and you know just regular fiberglass and that cast is not quote unquote waterproof but it does have a Gore-Tex liner and the Gore-Tex liner is more breathable allows for parents to get in there with baby wipes and wipe down the inside of the cast 
but it is not a cast that the child can go in a hot tub in, cannot, you know, go in a shower or bathtub in. But we feel that the importance of maintaining that hip reduction with a extremely well molded, choke enteric molded cast is more important than being able to go in a hot tub, bathtub or swimming pool or shower. Does that make sense? Did I say that clearly enough? Yes, yes, I think so. And then a, a couple others uh, with the cutting away from the perineum, what are your boundary marks to make sure enough room is given for diapers and waste and cleanup? There, there are a number around your instructions to the parents for, for cleaning. Yeah, okay. so our, if any of you are parents, then you realize like, what does it take to fit in one of the smallest diapers? So like a newborn diaper, is what we fit into the perineal area. And then a large diaper, like a number six size diaper goes on the outside. So in general, you have to, in a boy, be able to see their pubic synthesis, you know, their genitals. Um, often you can see their like medial uh, hip crease in their groin. And then you have to be able to see their buttocks and uh, have enough room that you can fit you know, just like your tips of your fingers above that to get a small newborn size diaper in that entire area. So it's, you know, it's a fairly large, um, I'll say perineal cutout. If you're going to allow for adequate diapering and allow for parents to be able to adequately clean the perineal area um, of their children. And okay. Stay. Are there any other particular instructions you'll give to the parents? Uh, for when they're, so are, are we talking about just how, how to keep these casts clean? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you can use baby wipes. You can use um, baby soap on a washcloth and clean the perineal area and then wipe it off. Um, and then again, Sometimes um, you, if they do get a soilage, a pee and poo soilage, then I have them just take some um, alcohol, you know, like those alcohol pads and just kind of clean the edges of the, that are in the perineal area. And then basically double diapering with a newborn diaper on the inside, all the way tucked in. And then a bigger, larger, like the biggest child diaper you can put on the outside. But there will always be some soilage uh, if the child is not potty trained, and that's okay. Okay. We don't okay. judge on, you know, how clean the cast is when you bring your child back in after they've been in a spiky cast for six weeks. Right. You just want them to be able to run in the hallway. Exactly. <laughs> Did you notice he had his little big diaper on the outside? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now you, uh, one of the questions you showed one with just rolls, no liner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one with the liner. Do you have to use the waterproof rolls with that or just regular padding? Yeah. So if you want a entirely waterproof cast that a child can, um, take a shower in, go in treated water, bath up, hot tub, swimming pool, um, then you can either use the, the liner with the waterproof rolls. Um, and then the entire cast is, you know, water resilient. If you use the Gore-Tex liner and you don't use the waterproof rolls, you just use regular soft roll, then that cast will remain um, wet and it won't, you know, completely dry. And so we don't, we don't recommend that. If you want to have a cast, a hip spike cast that allows for being sub, fully submerged in treated water, then you need to have the waterproof rolls plus or minus the aqua liner um, okay. for that to be uh, a reasonable option. And are, are there any indications that would necessitate casting both legs to knee on the unaffected side versus the single leg and pelvis? Yeah, so it depends on your femur fracture and it depends on how big the child is, right? So um, if you have femur fractures that are higher up, so that fracture that was shown in the video is sort of like mid shaft um, spiral fracture in a two-year-old. 
So they were able to, with just a single leg belly band, get enough control over that fracture for it to heal because two-year-olds heal really fast. That cat, that fracture is going to callus up in, you know, three weeks and be stable. If you have an older child, it's going to take longer to callus up. And if you have a fracture that's higher, more in the subtrochanteric or even intertrochanteric area, then a single leg with a belly band will not be sufficient for you to control that fracture. And you're gonna need to go and at least um, cast the other leg to just above uh, the knee to control the pelvis enough to then allow control of the femur fracture. So smaller children with mid diaphyseal or distal femoral fractures, uh, can be easily treated in a single leg belly band, but larger children or more proximal fractures need to have the other leg incorporated to allow you to control the fracture well enough to get it to heal in an appropriate position. Okay, perfect. I think that addressed that, that question. And then what is the name of the tape that you use to pedal the spica? Yes, we. it's called Delta Terry Net is what we use here. It is extremely sticky on, it's like really sticky. And then the outside is a little bit fuzzy. So it's super soft in the perineal area, but you can tell those casts were not meant to be fully submerged. If you're gonna fully submerge and want a true, you know, waterproof spica, then you'd be better off using, like they show duct tape or hockey tape or some other form of tape that is uh, water resilient. We, we have a number of uh, folks throughout the country who use high tape. It's uh, it's kind of that salmon colored waterproof. Oh yeah. Tape. Yep. It's, that stuff. I'm not going to lie. I hate to be a, you know, a Debbie downer. It is <laughs> not, it doesn't have the best adhesive quality. You know what I mean? Like when you go to stick it, it's not the stickiest tape I've ever used in my life, but it, it does fulfill the requirements to make the cast, you know, water resilient, waterproof. Okay. I would give the parents an extra roll of that to go home with, um, <laughs> just in case they have pieces of tape that try to fall off. It's like their parting gift, a little bonus gift to go home with. Okay, that, that makes sense. Now, is there an easy, to way, a easy way to tell what size liner to use for a patient? Yeah, it's right on the package. So I'm going to grab one. So... Basically, it comes with the packages and it's a beautiful insert that the company has done. Can you guys see it? But basically, it's based on the age. So if you have a baby that's four to six months old or younger, you're going to use a size two. And then basically any child about up to age two is going to be a size four. And then age three is a size six. And then over age three, you usually are going up to like a size eight or greater. And then you also can measure, you can put a um, measuring tape around their waist and you can also measure the waist because sometimes children are younger in age, but thicker in girth. And then they need a little wider, um, a wider liner. And so then you would go up in size in them as well. Okay, and then there's a there's a few questions around um, the application time. Does it take longer to use this product or to make it a fully water or a waterproof or a uh, use this product? No, um, it doesn't take more time. Um, I th I think you just have to have you know the the appropriate product there, and then um, obviously have enough help to apply the spiky cast in a efficient, you know, manner. Um, so for me, um, I always have a resident or fellow with me. And then um, when I'm at Scottish Rite and then at Children's, if I want, I can have a cast tech come in to help me. But basically you would want someone helping you that understands what a spiky cast is how the child's going to need to be held and then how to efficiently and quickly, you know, wrap. And then really the most time comes in when you're cutting out the perineal area. 
So either you or a cast tech who's very efficient with the cast saw when cutting out the perineal area, I would say that's what takes the most amount of time is getting that just right. Okay. All right. And then another spike of question, and hopefully I'm asking this correctly, how superior should cast go just below lowest rib? Yeah. So it depends on, again, what you're treating. So if it's um, a femur fracture that's mid-shaft or uh, more distal in a younger child, you can see that single leg belly band, um, you know, kind of was at the bottom of the ribs, giving them a little more abdominal room. Um, when we're doing a hip spike up for uh, a hip dysplasia, we're really trying to hold that hip in. We actually go to nipple line. So we'll go as high as the nipple line and try to make that cast a little bit taller so that we have the most, you know, rigid uh, construct we have holding that hip in a reduced position because basically the cast is holding the hip reduced while you're waiting for the capsule and the other soft tissues to kind of tighten up and remodel in that new position. So we go really a lot higher on the um, spike and cast for hip dysplasia compared to like a distal femur fracture. So again, it just depends on what you're trying, what, how much stability you're trying to impart to like which part of the body. Okay. And that, there looks like there's about three or four round cost. And one of them, it says, is there an extra cost to do a waterproof hip spica? Does insurance reimburse that extra cost? So that's an excellent question. Uh, at Scottish Rite, you're going to laugh. We charge an extra $25 for a waterproof cast compared to a regular cast. And I do, I am not aware. So I don't know if you guys um, from the corporate side are, are aware. If I truly don't believe that insurance reimburses differently for a waterproof versus a non waterproof cast, but I am not 100% sure of that. Or do you guys have that information? Uh, so it, I, it seems to, to us that it, each market is slightly different, but I, I know that's typically on uh, upper and lower extremity fractures. Um, I'll, I'll check with some of our other, uh, other clients about, about that and, and respond back to everybody. So, yeah, I don't think you get reimbursed more from the, um, from the insurance company, but basically I think what you get is just a lot more happy parents and children, especially here in Texas. Like if you can have a kid in a waterproof cast that allows them to bathe and swim, you have a happy kid and a happy parent. Um, and I think that then probably gets you some repeat business. Um, uh, so I don't know that insurance companies uh, pay you more money for a waterproof versus a non-waterproof cast. Right. I, I think referring back to your earlier point about the, the $12,700, yeah. you have to go back. I mean, that, that seems like that you just need one of them to, to really. Oh my God. Yeah. Having to get a full anesthetic. So OR time is the most expensive thing there is, right? So if you can not go to the OR and avoid any cast complication that requires a repeat sedation or anesthesia, you are saving everybody tons of money especially yeah. the insurance company. All right. And it looks like it, a couple back on the, uh, on the clinical side, it says the Aquacast liner rolls with the hipster liner seems to be thin enough to get the trochantric stabilization needed for hip dysplasia with full waterproof padding without using plaster. What are your thoughts on this? I'm just going to fight you to the <laughs> nail on that one. I mean, this is how I've been trained, right? So I, uh, I did my residency at the Mayo Clinic. I did my fellowship here at Scottish Rite. I have for a first time close reduction that you are really just holding that hip in with the cast. I personally do not think you can get a good trochanteric mold that is going to hold that hip in the socket where you want it. I personally don't trust it. And I don't think it's worth the risk of having to have a repeat anesthesia and have that hip lose reduction because you said, I want to try this. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think you can, you can try it. Maybe you will prove me wrong, but I personally, for the first cast, that very first reduction where you're checking the MRI to make sure that the hip is in, 
I am not willing to risk that. So those kids get plastered with fiberglass over the top. And that may seem old and that may be seen like totally like 1984, but I know I get good results with that and my hips stay in the socket. No, so if someone wants to do a really good study and prove that, I'll be happy to see your data on the podium. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think just going back to your point, if you have to go back to the OR for a reduction, that that's that's once again. Yeah, it, and these it, are babies, right? Like, so you're doing closed reductions in like six to nine month olds up to 18 month olds. You know what I mean? And that's where the risk of repetitive anesthesia is the highest in any child under three. So if you're not a hundred percent certain that you're going to be able to hold that hip in with that really well molded cast, I think that you're, that's too risky. That's, that's too much risk to take. Yep. And then uh, one around swimming, do you allow swimming in water other yeah. than the pool? Not so it has to be treated water, right? Okay. So it has to, you don't want to be in a lake or river or ocean because there's bacteria in that water. And even though the water is going to, you know, come out of the cast, there's going to be remnants. And then I don't think you can guarantee um, the, you know, how clean the cast and how sanitary the cast stays. So we say treated water, meaning bathtub, hot tub, swimming pool, shower. No lake, river, ocean, mud puddle, stream. That is not going to cut it. No, that, that, that makes sense. And then uh, now, do you, do you do these casts yourself or does an ortho? I do. Okay. I'm, a, again, I'm old school. We have cast techs. Um, that will, so it's funny, they'll come in to um, put uh, hip spike casts on um, in the middle of the night, like in the ER or in this, what we call, um, it's sort of like a sedation area. That's not the actual OR, it's just outside the OR, it's called the APU. But like in the OR, if I'm uh, putting a, a hip spike cast on, I personally apply all my own hip spike casts. I weirdly enjoy it. I think cast application is an art and it's a, it's an art that we're slowly losing in our field. And I feel like pediatric orthopedics is like the last mainstay of appropriate cast application. And I'm personally not willing to give that up to, you know, a cast tech. No, so, I understand. And, and we train our residents and fellows, you know, in appropriate cast application, you know, with hands on training. Awesome. And then do you use these on scoliosis patients? Yeah. So that's a great question. I was just chatting uh, with the gentleman. I do a lot of metacasts for uh, infantile idiopathic scoliosis. Um, and Right now, I've been using a silver impregnated t-shirt um, that is antimicrobial um, and then not been using a Gore-Tex liner or the um, waterproof cast padding. But as I am progressing, I guess, in my practice and my care of these patients, I would love to give children an opportunity to be able to bathe and swim because the average amount of time my patients spend in a metacast is about 12 solid months. Um, so it, I'm considering using, you know, waterproof uh, aqualiner materials for metacast. I'm just trying to, you know, figure out the semantics of it all. Um, but I think that is a, a real uh, possibility for me in the future. Gotcha. Great. Okay. Well, that that is a we had a one or two others but they all kind of hit the same topic so i think we're we're gonna kind of end the session right now but uh unless dr uh Maktosh, you had anything else to add no just i mean i'm glad so many uh, people could join and participate tonight i think like i said i think hip spike casting is really an art um and I think there's a lot of tips and tricks that you can, you know, get out of these videos. And I do think that, uh, you know, truly waterproof casts can be really beneficial to the patients. And that basically we all just have to figure out in our own practices who we think are best served by those casts. 
And right now in my practice, it's definitely femur fractures, um, you know, possibly moving forward to metacasting and then whether or not you want to apply these casts for first time close reduction DDH and things, I think you can, you know, work those details out in your own practice. But I think the strongest indication are, you know, femur fractures. Well, terrific. Yep. That makes sense. Well, well, once again, Dr. McIntosh, thank you very much. And on behalf of uh, you and the Aquacast team, uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. And if you would like more information about this, we were we will um, email everybody tomorrow with the uh, a link to this presentation as well as a, a webinar offer. And so, um, with that, we'll let everybody get back to their evenings and days, depending on what part of the world you're in. And thanks again, Doctor. Bye. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a good night.